Good evening. Simple mistakes by an experienced pilot cost the lives of five people today in northern Saskatchewan. Two aircraft, one on approach, the other departing, collided in midair just before noon. We have more details in this report. A simple mistake. Sometimes that's all it takes. These situations can develop for any number of reasons. Perhaps there is non-compliance due to attitude, time pressures, or company expectations. Poor judgment, decision making, or communication could play a role, as could poor pilot technique. The best way to ensure safe operations at uncontrolled aerodromes is to follow the required procedures, always. One pilot and his passenger, they were victims of circumstance. The other pilot, his passengers included two clients, took pains to ensure the aircraft was safe. The passengers were thoroughly briefed and the weather was within acceptable limits. His error, however, was twofold. First, he made an approach without regard to the standard circuit joining procedures when flying under VFR at an uncontrolled aerodrome. His first simple mistake. Despite this error, he might still have avoided the tragedy had he followed one other procedure that is a staple of good airmanship. As we follow this pilot on his flight to Laurent, Saskatchewan from Thompson, Manitoba, see if you recognize it. It was another simple mistake, but one that cost five lives. The goal of every pilot, of course, is to go from point A to point B without incident. Pre-flight checks, a well-maintained aircraft, appropriate passenger briefings, all ensure a safe and comfortable journey for everyone aboard. Even the most conscientious pilot could make an error. It may be a minor mistake, enabling the pilot to learn from it. If the mistake is not minor, Generally, the consequences aren't either. This video is intended for all pilots who operate at or in the vicinity of uncontrolled aerodromes. While this information was presented during your initial training, this dramatization will serve to remind even accomplished pilots that experience is no substitute for attention to detail, especially when flying in the vicinity of an uncontrolled aerodrome. As you will see, fixed-wing aircraft are used in this video. The information, however, applies equally to those of you who fly helicopters. As every pilot knows, ongoing communication is critical to the safe passage of all aircraft, whether they are fixed-winged or rotor-winged. And this communication should start even before the wheels begin to roll. Thompson Radio, this is Cessna Foxtrot Echo Charlie Delta, taxiing Thompson Airport for departure on runway 23, destination Orange. For the information to be useful to other people both in the air and on the ground, the pilot needs to transmit a number of critical pieces of information on the appropriate frequency. The pilot needs to identify the recipient of the message. This is generally done by identifying the aerodrome or targeting a more general audience. For example, Thompson Radio is a directed transmission. While Lanigan Traffic is a broadcast transmission, one not directed to a particular receiving station. The pilot must then identify the aircraft, giving its type or manufacturer's name, as well as the registration. In this case, it would be Cessna Foxtrot Echo Charlie Delta. The pilot should then provide the location, including the aircraft's altitude or position on the ground, giving enough detailed information so as to leave no doubt as to the aircraft's exact location. It is best to give a location that is easily identifiable. However, when no obvious landmark can be used, a precise bearing and distance from an easily identifiable feature, usually the airport, should be given. The pilot should also include information well in advance about his or her intentions. This too is critical, as other airborne or ground personnel make decisions based on this knowledge. Leaving it out or not providing it well in advance can be hazardous, if not deadly. It is a well-established fact that pilots who are expecting to see something because they've been told its approximate location are nine times more likely to see it than if they happen upon it by chance. 
There are other important safety-related elements you should also bear in mind, particularly when arriving or departing. Maintain a listening watch on the designated frequency until you are 5 to 10 miles clear of the area. Constantly scan for other aircraft. You should report your position again when you are clear of an area or enter a new area where there is a potential for conflict. For example, report when you leave or enter an aerodrome traffic circuit. Report when you have cleared the runway after landing and report joining the circuit, giving your position in the traffic pattern. Report your intentions at least five minutes in advance of entering the MF or ATF. Taxiing for runway 23, straight out departure to 5,500 feet, destination LaRange. As you can see, communication plays a critical role in the safe operation of your aircraft, from the time you board until the time you tie it down. While our pilot and his passengers are en route, let's take a moment to review aircraft operations when flying under visual flight rules at an uncontrolled aerodrome. That is, an aerodrome without an operating control tower. Of course, there is no substitute for pilot alertness while in the vicinity of an uncontrolled aerodrome. Pilots should always be aware of and on the lookout for other traffic. As you approach the circuit, turn your landing lights and navigation lights on. This could mean the difference between being seen and being a statistic, and it will also help prevent bird strikes. Good airmanship combined with the following procedures, which can be found in the Aeronautical Information Publication, or AIP, will help ensure a safe flight for all. Aircraft to aircraft separation is maintained through visual contact. The best way to maintain that contact is to regularly move your head in all directions. This constant scanning will help to eliminate natural as well as physical blind spots. Visually divide the sky into sections and search each one for other aircraft. Remember, aircraft separation is maintained visually, procedurally and through constant communications. To achieve maximum safety, all radio-equipped aircraft must monitor and use common designated frequencies. But what frequency? The vicinity around uncontrolled aerodromes is designated one of two ways. It is called either a mandatory frequency area known as an MF or an aerodrome traffic frequency area known as an ATF. When so designated, an MF or ATF is normally a circle with a five nautical mile radius capped at 3,000 feet above aerodrome elevation. The following radio procedures shall be followed at uncontrolled aerodromes within an MF area and should be followed by pilots operating in an ATF area. On the maneuvering area, report intentions when entering and maintaining a listening watch. Prior to and during departure, a number of procedures shall be followed. First, report intentions prior to entering onto the runway. The pilot then calls when commencing takeoff and reports leaving the circuit. The pilot monitors the MF or ATF frequency until 5 to 10 miles from the area. Prior to arrival, report position, altitude, arrival procedure intentions, and estimated time of landing at least five minutes prior to entering the MF or ATF area. Another report, this one identifying the position in the traffic pattern, is given when joining the circuit. A report is also given on the downwind leg if applicable, when established on final, and when clear of the active runway after landing. This also applies to pilots flying continuous circuits. At aerodromes that have published instrument approaches, the MF or ATF area may be expanded to include the approach area. Remember to consult the Canada Flight Supplement, or CFS, for current information on the destination and en route aerodromes as part of your pre-flight preparations. The CFS is published every 56 days, and because the information in the book changes regularly, it is important to refer to a current edition. Although rare, there are uncontrolled aerodromes without a published MF or ATF. In such a case, the recommended common frequency is 123.2 megahertz, and the reporting procedures are the same. 
When planning to operate at aerodromes with no MF or ATF, you should find out from operators who regularly fly in that area which frequency is used. It is important to note that good airmanship dictates that you always keep your radio on, with the volume set so you can hear incoming calls. When you make calls, do so even if you think you are alone in a given area. You owe it to yourself, your passengers, and other pilots to make these blind calls. You never know who may be listening, or whose life you may save. It may even be your own. It's been a pleasant flight for all aboard. As he should, the pilot has reported his position, altitude, arrival procedures, and ETA well in advance of his arrival. He has also transmitted critical information along the way, whenever he approached or transited through another aerodrome area. But our pilot is about to make one of two mistakes that combined will turn out to be fatal. His first mistake, neglecting to follow standard circuit joining procedures for uncontrolled aerodromes. Knowing the standard circuit joining procedures is critical to flying safely at an uncontrolled aerodrome. These procedures have been developed to help ensure safe landings and departures for all aircraft and incorporate strategies that allow pilots to see, as much as possible, all other traffic around them. This is particularly important in an ATF area where aircraft without radios are permitted. Nordo aircraft may operate in an MF area, provided an FSS, a CARS, or an RCO is located at the aerodrome and is operated at the time of the intended flight and prior arrangements have been made with the appropriate agency. We will describe them for you. But it's worth noting that the procedures are outlined in detail in the Aeronautical Information Publication. The following procedures apply to all aircraft operating at aerodromes where an air traffic control service is not provided. It's worth remembering that a number of uncontrolled aerodromes have instrument approaches. You should know if IFR traffic will be in your area and where it is so you can avoid conflicts. Also remember that left-hand circuits are standard at an uncontrolled aerodrome unless a right-hand circuit has been specified in the Canada Flight Supplement. Because the information in the CFS can change between printings, updates are passed on through NOTAMs. Calling a flight service station will help ensure you have the most current information. One other general note. Because there is no air traffic control service at an uncontrolled aerodrome, priority and sequencing are not given to one aircraft over another. Rules of the air with respect to right of way and priority are still in effect. Always remember, personal courtesy and good airmanship should be practiced at all times. This is a typical aerodrome. This example shows two runways, but all pilots are expected to use the active runway, which is generally the one most nearly aligned into the wind. The active can also be identified by watching the movement of other aircraft and by listening on the radio. Aircraft should join the circuit at an altitude of 1,000 feet above aerodrome elevation, or at the altitude published in the CFS, and maintain that altitude until further descent is required for landing. The green arrows show where you should enter the circuit after descending to circuit altitude on the upwind side. If no conflicts exist, the aircraft may also join on the downwind leg. If it is necessary for you to cross the airport prior to joining the circuit, this should be done at midfield, at least 500 feet above circuit altitude, which, in our example, would put us at 1,500 feet above aerodrome elevation. All descents to circuit altitude should be made on the upwind side of the runway, or well clear of the circuit. When airport advisory information is available within a mandatory frequency, or MF area, pilots may also enter the circuit in the downwind leg, on base leg, or on final. These should be used only once it has been established without a doubt that there is no conflict with any other aircraft. Aircraft may join the circuit straight in, or at a 45 degree angle to the downwind leg, straight in to the base leg, or straight in to the final leg. It's worth repeating that these points of entry should only be used in MF areas. When departing the circuit or airport, 
Aircraft should climb straight ahead on the departure runway heading until reaching circuit traffic altitude before commencing a turn in any direction. Turning back towards the circuit or airport should not be done until the aircraft is at least 500 feet above the circuit altitude. These procedures are also meant to be used by helicopters, but since they seldom have a need for a runway, their arrival or departure procedures will likely be based on wind direction and their desire to stay away from airplanes. Helicopter crews must be very detailed in their description of where they are, where they are going on the aerodrome, and how they intend to get there. In addition, Helicopter pilots are urged to avoid air taxiing or flying low across runways where there is a risk of collision with other aircraft or land vehicles. And while good airmanship includes keeping a sharp lookout, helicopter pilots should also avoid low flying or hovering in an area where they might blow up dust, sand, gravel or other material. This flying debris is not only an airborne hazard, but if blown onto runways or paved surfaces, may cause dangerous conditions for others. We now rejoin our pilot. Not following standard circuit joining procedures at an uncontrolled aerodrome will be this pilot's first mistake. His second may not be so obvious. He had been monitoring his radio well in advance of his arrival, and he announced his position as he should. Mirage Radio, this is Cessna, Fox Charlie Delta, 3,500 feet, 18 miles west of Mirage Airport. Inbound for landing runway 17, LaRoche. Did you recognize this pilot's second mistake? Unfortunately, it's not uncommon. He had been transmitting and monitoring on the wrong frequency. Had he checked the CFS, he would have found out that the frequency had just changed. He didn't check it because he thought he knew it. He was dead wrong. Oh, oh my God. Thank you.